Today's podcast is brought to you by Live Adam. Live Adam is a local Rochester business that helps businesses grow online by generating more leads. You can find out more about them by visiting them at liveadam.com. That's L I V E A T O M.com. I'm Amanda Leitner, and welcome to Rochester Rising, where we amplify the stories of Rochester entrepreneurs. Welcome to episode 144 of the podcast today. So this week on the podcast, we had the great opportunity to chat with local innovators, Cheryl Ness and Vincenzo Gian Giordano. Cheryl is a native of Cassin. She grew up a local farm girl and amassed over 30 years of experience as a nurse in Mayo Clinic. Vincenzo is a native of a town called Abruzzo in rural Italy. He's a trained chef and he's worked all over Italy learning traditional Italian cooking before settling in Tuscany. Vincenzo lived in the Tuscany region of Italy for 15 years, running a restaurant with two other business partners. Today, he makes the fresh pasta at Terza, and he owns and runs his own business called Vin Chef Cooking, where he provides cooking classes, private dinners, and other chef services. So today on the podcast, we talk about major risks that both this husband and wife have taken in their careers to live out their dreams. We chat about Cheryl's book that came out last year, Love in a Tuscan Kitchen, that describes her travels and life in Italy as she made some major decisions in her career and met and fell in love with Vincenzo over his chocolate cake. So I just got done reading this book last week. It's a lovely, lovely story about following your heart, um, making unexpected choices, and making choices that make sense to the life that you want to live. So it's a great story full of a lot of colorful imagery, colorful people, and really great recipes. I also had the fantastic chance to take a cooking class last week at Fig with Cheryl and Vincenzo. So if you have an opportunity to do so, I highly recommend it. It was delicious and a very informative um, time. So on the podcast today, we talk about the universality of food. We talk about how Cheryl took a chance on love and moved from Rochester to Tuscany, where she lived for six years. We chat about the difficulties and hard work that Vincenzo and his business partners had to put into their restaurant in the Chianti region of Tuscany to keep it running and to pay taxes on the business. We talk about Vincenzo and Cheryl's decision to move back to Minnesota to be closer to Cheryl's family, and we chat about Vincenzo's decision to leave his restaurant. We talk about Cheryl's book, Love in a Tuscan Kitchen, describing her relationship with Vincenzo and the people, food, and traditions of the medieval Tuscan village called San Gusmi, where they met and lived for several years. We talk about intentional risk-taking and unexpected choice-making that both Cheryl and Vincenzo did to create a better life for themselves. And we describe the value of following your heart. To wrap up the podcast, we talk about the process of getting a book published in Rochester or in the U.S. and how Cheryl and Vincenzo are currently promoting her book. And we end the discussion by talking about the Rochester restaurant and pop-up food scene. So we have a great discussion on the podcast today. So sit back and listen to Cheryl and Vincenzo's story. Well, thanks for being here today, Cheryl and Vincenzo. It's Thank it you. should be yeah, Thank you. an awesome and very very exciting talk, I think. So, this was an interesting one for me because it's a little different from what I've talked about before. So, I thought the best way kind of to start was for each of you to kind of talk about your background as kind of individuals going up to sure. when you guys met in in Italy as we were talking about before before we started here. Okay. Well, okay. I can start, and then I'll pass the baton to Vincenzo. So I'm a local girl. I grew up in and near Rochester. Um, I'm a farm girl, so those are my roots. I grew up on a farm just south of Casson, and um, I think that, for me, was kind of a really grounding experience um, with traditions and foods. And so I know I write about that in the book, that, that it was something that I really identified with when I traveled to Italy. But... Um, my time here in Rochester, I worked as a nurse for um, over 30 years at Mayo Clinic, and that was my entire career. Um, I still work as a nurse, uh, but really, my, my roots are here in Minnesota. I love Rochester. We love being back here, even though we miss Italy a lot, <laughs> so we go back and forth. 
Um, but that's really just the basics about me. Vincenzo, maybe I'll introduce him and then he can say a few words, but Vincenzo yeah. is from Abruzzo, so he's Italian, and his parents um, are Italian and from, from that area, and his roots are also very much in from rural Italy. Um, Abruzzo is very much farm country. It's where pasta, the pasta di Cecco is made, and um, it's just a really beautiful mountainous area near the Adriatic Sea. And um, he um, trained as a chef, uh, and the school that he went to was, mm -hmm. yes. what, 30 minutes away from your yes, house? Yes, 30 minutes, yeah. And uh, so well, that was lucky. He had that <laughs> available to him. And then once he um, finished training, he worked really all over Italy, um, apprenticed in different restaurants, um, and really learned the traditions, the pastas, the sauces, the, everything that you would want to learn about a region food-wise through that experience. Um, and eventually settled in Tuscany, where we met. I live in Tuscany 15 years. <laughs> yes. It's a beautiful area. Yes. <laughs> and that's where he had a restaurant with yes. his partners, Marco and Aldo. Yeah. Uh, it's seven years for uh, you know, my restaurant. We have this restaurant uh, in San Guzmi, very small town yes. <laughs> uh, in Chianti. Village. It's between Siena and uh, Florence. It's very small town, it's 200 people, <laughs> yes. very small, uh, but very beautiful. Yeah, right in the heart of Chianti. And I think, you know, as I describe it in the book, like my first experience at that restaurant was sort of life-changing. <laughs> um, I sat there and I thought, wow, this is an incredible space. It's, it was an old palace. It was like the bottom of a... Um, an old palace, so it had the well from the original palace there, and they had um, really decorated and kept the restaurant in a very authentic way with the brick and stonework. Um, it was really breathtaking. And then, of course, the food experience <laughs> was um, incredible. And I knew that whoever had was behind the food and that whole experience had to be someone who really cared for people through their food. And so that was Vincenzo, <laughs> even though I didn't meet him the first time I ate there. But. And uh, especially because I am, all, um, I am very lucky because um, all places I, uh, I work mm -hmm. and uh, always I have an old woman he, he teach me for the old the recipe. The recipes, <laughs> yes. the traditions. This is traditional. This yes. is very, uh, I'm very lucky for this. And I start uh, and when me nine, nine, nine years old with my grandma with making yeah. gnocchi yes. <laughs> in the morning. that's how he learned to, to make every gnocchi. Sunday morning because yes. it's special <laughs> and uh, I remember she make a fresh pasta every day oh, mm -hmm. yeah. and I look at her and it's okay maybe uh, I maybe try the school <laughs> yes. uh, yeah. now it's 31 years <laughs> okay <laughs> Chef, yeah yeah, I think that is the exact way to learn from the old traditions. The, that's the same way I, I learned from my, my grandfather. Unfortunately, my grandmother had passed away by the time I was born. But, uh, you know, we had her old recipes Cookbooks. as much as I, you know, we were talking about the the Italian culture in, in Pittsburgh, at, at least, mm -hmm. where, I, where I'm from. And, you know, my great aunts were like, they'd make the lasagna oh, every oh week. Gosh, There's yeah. nothing <laughs> like that, right? And... These recipes aren't even written down anywhere. No, they They're weren't. in their heads, right? <laughs> and so, yes, when I tried, I started collecting recipes for the book. Um, I wanted some of his mom. His mom is a wonderful cook. Um, Conchetta is incredible. And she had recipes, but they were only in her head. Yeah. <laughs> and so many of them took me two or three years to get written down because I would start working with her trying to write it down, and mm -hmm. then I'd miss something. And she's like, oh, don't worry about it. It's nothing. And I'm like, no, you know, I want to get every little step. So, yeah. yeah. And I think a lot of the time they don't even know because right. it's just like you feel it's it. It's automatic. You just, yeah, yeah, you just add things, and, and that's how it goes. Yeah. So I can imagine, you know, that experience with his grandmother, who, I mean, she sounded oh, yeah. like she was an incredible cook, too. I'm glad that she influenced him that way so that he was, went on to explore being a chef, mm -hmm. which is how we met. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so I wanted to lead into that then. So Cheryl, you loved to travel and you visited mm -hmm. Italy several times. And then on the third time, you um, yes. met Vincenzo um, and his chocolate cake, <laughs> which sounded <laughs> yes. like it was life changing. So yeah, yeah. do you, you want to kind of just walk through, you know, that part and, sure. um, you know, what that experience was like? 
So, yes, I mean, I never expected to have that experience um, or to have it change my life like it did. It was a simple thing. I was, um, well, I was drawn back to Italy for some reason. And, you know, as a traveler, you enjoy visiting places and then you think, oh, okay, I've done that, so I don't need to go back. But my heart kept telling me to go back to Italy and I had no idea why. Um, and so whenever I sign books now, I always say, always follow your heart because your heart knows things that you maybe don't always understand at the beginning. Mm -hmm. And um, my heart knew that maybe Vincenzo was there waiting for me. <laughs> and so the third time on, on my third visit, um, I was eating at his restaurant and I, was, I had been in the village for a while visiting friends and I was on sabbatical. And uh, it was probably two weeks before I was going to leave. And I was enjoying the food as I always did. Um, and the chocolate cake especially was one of my favorites. I'm a foodie. I love, you know, different things. But chocolate, of course, is a big favorite of mine. And this is like a, a hot chocolate cake that was served with vanilla ice cream. And it was just delicious. It had a little sauce next to it. And I think I said under my breath, I could eat this every day. <laughs> <laughs> and Marco, the sommelier, or the, the maitre d' and one of the partners in the restaurant, whispered in my ear. He heard me. He said, we're here every day. <laughs> <laughs> and I said, well, I'm not going to be, um, I'm leaving soon. I'm going back to Minnesota. So I'd love the recipe for this because it's just delicious. And, and he said, oh, sure. Let's go talk to Vincenzo, the chef. He's in the kitchen and he'll give, give you the recipe, recipe. No problem. And I was surprised because we don't we aren't able to do that in the U.S. We can't just walk back into the restaurant kitchen and meet the chef, usually. Not really. <laughs> <laughs> Never. Yeah. yeah, and so I was surprised by his answer, and I got up and followed him back into the kitchen and met Vincenzo. And um, I remember he was just cleaning up his kitchen. It was kind of the end of the night, and my friend's little girl was right behind me. She's, she was about <laughs> six and a half at the time. Her, she's Emma, and um, I was nanny to her during the time that I was there. And she and Vincenzo were good friends. Yes. <laughs> and she ran up and jumped into his arms and, you know, was already, like, um, just knew him really well. And so when I asked him for the recipe in my very poor Italian, he responded to me in Italian that, well, a broken English, I, I don't speak any English. <laughs> and Nothing. I said, oh, this is going to be tough to get this recipe. <laughs> no yes. speak English is what you Nothing. said. <laughs> and so I thought, oh, okay, what am I going to do? And Emma, of course, came up with the great solution that she could help us because she was <laughs> bilingual. She spoke English and Italian, and she also loved his chocolate cake. So to this day... Um, we call her our little Cupid because yes. a few days later we went back together and I got the recipe through Emma's translation. And um, that's how our relationship really began. There was definitely this kind of spark that happened that day. Um, of course, the language barrier was a tough one. Um, I did know some Italian enough to, ha I mean, I had lived there for six months. So I could have a conversation, but I couldn't really get a complicated recipe. So um, that's how we met over the hot chocolate cake. And now we call it the hot chocolate love cake because, <laughs> because it's what brought us together. <laughs> and when we do cooking experiences here in Rochester now and throughout um, the U.S., um, that's usually the featured dessert that we make. And yeah. we tell the story. <laughs> so it's a lot of fun to share that recipe. No, I think that's a great story. And we were talking about, you know, connecting through food because the mm -hmm. language barrier was... Significant Huge. in the beginning. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Better now, I'm sure. But, you know, in the beginning, it's, you know, the food and the shared shared interests and, yeah. you know, humanity, I think. So. Well, and it's that caring for people, right? My mm -hmm. mom did that. She cared for us through the food she made every day. Um, and I could tell that whoever made the food in the restaurant that Vincenzo had, you know, there was something special about it. And I see that even today when he cooks. Um, he's very passionate about what he does and he takes care and puts love into everything he does um, and so I think that might be that universal thing that we can connect with um, with throughout every culture you know the mom in the kitchen cooking for the kids um, when they come home from school for example and you know those memories are something we always have and the grandmother cooking for Sunday dinners 
Mm -hmm. This is also a tradition in Italy. Um, We do that too. (laughs) In my family, (laughs) yeah. And also what I really appreciated too about the Italian culture is they still have a lot of, they're very proud of their foods. They're very proud of their traditions. They've preserved them and they've hold them really closely as treasures. Um, And even in families, um, you could see still that the grandmother was in the kitchen cooking for the family. And many times, multi-generational families still lived together and took care of each other. And so that, for me, was really eye-opening and something I appreciated about the Italian culture. Yeah. I think we do things quite differently here. Mm -hmm. It's very single family. Yes. You know? Yes. Yeah. Large house and I know you know it's just yeah a complete difference in in culture um yeah so now you you said you split your time between or at Mm -hmm. least travel to Italy frequently and live in Minnesota here so what kind of influenced that decision to come here and how do you convince Vincenzo to leave (laughs) beautiful Tuscany no I mm, I like Rochester and he loves it here. Like I'm the one that cries every time we go back and forth. <laughs> no, because for me it's much better because it's no big city. Right. It's perfect for me. It's mm-hmm. intimate. And uh, this, nice. the, the people is fantastic here. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, we here because the, the my parents. family is here. <laughs> mm-hmm. So yeah, I mean, after we met, you know, it was a year. We um, kind of communicated back and forth, and eventually I moved to Italy, took a chance on love with Vincenzo, <laughs> and it really paid off big time. Um, we were married a year after that and then lived in Tuscany for six years. And so really the book is kind of focused on those years. It's that really intimate and life-changing experience of living in this village and <clears throat> living those customs and traditions I saw around me every day. Um, but it was a really tough decision to move back. Um, We moved back about five years ago now. And um, mostly it was my family that um, drew me back. My parents are here in the area and my brothers. So um, I didn't want to miss out on my years with my parents. Mm -hmm. Um, They're getting older and just, you know, for me that was important. Um, And my nieces and nephews are growing up and I didn't want to miss those years either. So but it was a really tough decision because we also had a very close relationship with everyone in San Guzme. This village had become like family to us. And um, yes, it was a tough, really tough decision. So, I mean, I think the book pays honor, um, pays homage to their traditions. And, their, you know, I even feature a few of the people from the village as in little vignettes so you can hear and listen and and um, read about their experiences and how they influenced me. But um, it was my family that drew, drew us back. And then I really felt like Vincenzo would have great opportunities here yes, I, as a chef. Especially because in, uh, in Italy now the problem is the tax is very high. Mm-hmm. And to be a business uh, owner, it's really uh, tough. Really? Okay. The economy yeah. is very mm-hmm. crazy, especially for the small restaurant. Okay. Uh, yeah. uh, this is a very big problem now. Yeah. Uh, this why for me it's, it's very crazy. Uh, you work work every day very hard, mm-hmm. and you, uh, f- sometimes for nothing. <laughs> mm-hmm. I could uh, see that that he was. I mean, we barely saw each other mm-hmm. during the week. Um, he had one day off, and many times it was th- spent thinking about the restaurant, mm-hmm. um, which became his life really and a part of our life, a big part of our life. That's why the cover of the book has the picture of the restaurant on it. It's where we met, and it's really where our life revolved in Italy. Um, But I also saw that, uh, you know, he wanted something more, and he was open to that. It was hard for him to leave the restaurant, I'm very sure, because he had friends who were partners. Seven years, no. That's a long time. Yeah, yeah. (laughs) Yeah. And so it was heartbreaking. It really was. And it was a, his dream was to have that restaurant and be successful. And I could see, though, that it was a huge struggle mm-hmm. for him. Um, it, and the economy and the taxes, it, it was just sort of a combination of things that just didn't seem like it, it was a recipe for success for him and for yeah, them. It's very crazy. Because, uh, I repeat, you work very hard mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. just to pay for taxes. Yeah. This especially yeah. one is the small restaurant, you know. Yeah. And uh, because the restaurant, the, the people like it a, a lot, especially in the summer, it's very busy. busy. <laughs> yeah. yeah. A lot of uh, American <laughs> yeah. uh, heat in my restaurant. Uh, 
uh, I'm very lucky, it's beautiful, but you know, you work hard, sometimes you just pay for taxes. Yeah. For, and if we wanted to see each other, I would have to go to the restaurant. So <laughs> I spent a lot of time in the evenings and, you know, throughout the weekend um, helping. Maybe I was drying wine glasses or cutting bread or helping mm-hmm. carry plates. So um, for me, it became part a big part of my life, too. So um, And it always will be. I mean, I always have this dream of potentially going back someday and, and having that experience for him again. Um, mm-hmm. But for now, we're here. And we share that experience through cooking classes, Mm -hmm. which we love to do. He teaches the very traditional ways of making pasta and gnocchi and sauces. (laughs) And I help him with that. So I'm like his (laughs) sous chef. (laughs) Yes. Yes. So we do that right in in people's homes. Um, We don't really have a space right now. So we do that um, in your home. And um, we're really excited. You know, Amy and Linda are opening Fig. Yes. And that is how we connected, too. Um, they mentioned us to you. And we'll be, um, so we're just so excited that they're going to have such a beautiful kitchen for us to work with and have cooking classes and maybe even little pop up events. We love to do yeah. pop up restaurant nights. <laughs> and so we basically like take over a restaurant for the evening. It becomes his Italian restaurant for the night. And um, the menu is all authentic and delicious and people just love it we've we've had fun doing that too yeah no I'm so excited for for you guys to teach there and I will definitely be there when you're there because like like we were saying in the beginning you know a lot of these old recipes are not written down and then they get lost sometimes and that's kind of what happened uh with my family but you know going back to the restaurant in Italy I give you a lot of credit for kind of looking at it and saying you know this is just not working and not the lifestyle, you know, right. you want to lead together because that's so hard as a business owner, as an entrepreneur, as a restaurant owner yes. that, you yeah. know, it's like, it was a dream and he had to say goodbye to that. Yeah. And it was yes. heartbreaking. Yeah. Like I said, it's very hard, mm. but, uh, sometimes he, he need to change. You need to change because repeat, you work very hard for nothing. Mm-hmm. <laughs> uh, so uh, we needed to change. Uh, yeah, uh, take a risk. This is why, yeah, yeah exactly. the risk taking is... But repeat, I am lucky mm-hmm. because here in Rochester, the mm-hmm. people is very, very uh, mm-hmm. kind for, with me. Yes. Uh, he he loves uh, mm-hmm. Italian. <laughs> mm-hmm. <laughs> cooking. Uh, this is why I like to teach the people uh, f- not, ju- not just for mm-hmm. make fresh pasta, mm-hmm. just for understand w- why is born this this recipe, the history, uh, the history, mm-hmm. the history behind not it, not just make mm-hmm. the, uh, mm-hmm. the recipe. I think that's what people really enjoy is as we're cooking, he's talking about the recipes, but then he's also talking about why the dish is the way it is mm-hmm. and what region it's from and what traditions and what foods come from that region and why the recipe is made the way it is. Mm-hmm. And so that history um, that's taught with the, along with the recipe and the class and the technique um, and then, of course, we always sprinkle in our story, which is kind of fun <laughs> for people to learn about our story and um, the fact that I'm local mm-hmm. and he's from Italy. Mm-hmm. And, you know, it's just a, we have a lot of fun. We do. Yeah. <laughs> and, you know, he works full time also at Terza. He makes fresh pasta for them. And um, it, he's used to working so much that he does the cooking classes and the other events on his days off. Um, but like you can it. also, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you can also taste his pasta at Terza right uh, down the road here. So, yes. Mm-hmm. So I wanted to transition into talking more about your, your book. Mm-hmm. So you published Love in a Tuscan Kitchen, which is part memoir, part recipes, which yes. you brought a beautiful copy for me today. And I actually was going to go over to the library and get it. So for oh. anyone, it's free now. There's a couple copies yes. over there. Yeah, the so. library has four copies. <laughs> four copies, yep. yeah. Yep. So it is definitely over there. And I know around in the community as well. But um, can you talk a little bit about, you know, what people should expect from the book. And I guess, did you write it while you're in kind of Chianti or when you came back here or or both? Well, that's a good question. (laughs) So I didn't, I didn't um, set out to write a book. I didn't really, that wasn't one of the things that was in the back of my mind in this experience, but I did keep a journal. Um, I felt like the experience I had in Italy and just the, the, the way that my heart called me back to Italy and how I listened to what I needed to do um, for the, probably the first time in my life, I had done that, and I made um, a, 
a choice to do something that people didn't expect me to do. It was, you know, I had a career at Mayo. Mm -hmm. I was kind of on the fast track to becoming a, you know, a leader and manager. And I chose a different direction. Um, and I did that intentionally. And people, some people thought I was crazy. Oh, yeah, uh, people always yeah, will. <laughs> yeah, and that's okay. I understand that because it was very untraditional. It wasn't a tradition. It wasn't a good, it wasn't the right, it wasn't the choice that people expected me to make, I guess I wanted to say. And so I want to encourage people to, to if, if their heart tells them something, to listen to it. You know, I it took me a long time to make that decision to go to Italy, um, but... In the end, I had a plan B. So I knew that I could do something else. If it didn't work out, I had something in my in the back of my mind that I could have done. So, But the book kind of just, um, it'll take you in my, it takes you through my, through my eyes and in my, my footsteps right to Italy. It'll take you through the, the beautiful walks that I used to take. Um, I used to write down all the different things that I would see and the people that we got to know in the village, of course, these became family to us, and they embraced me. Um, and so it's that journey that the book takes you on. Um, and it's about those six years where we lived in Italy after we got married. It's also about our weddings, which are hilarious. Um, we got married three times. <laughs> and most of it is... Just for sure. <laughs> <laughs> Just to be sure, yes. Um, we had three weddings. The first wedding was in Tuscany, and that we, you know, that's our kind of our original mm-hmm. anniversary, right? So um, middle of July, it was beautiful. Um, we had a... a very gr- hot day. A so that great experience. Hot, yeah. It was beautiful and hot, yes. <laughs> And but the traditions of a Tuscan wedding are featured in that chapter, and some surprises also. Um, and then we had a celebration with his family in Abruzzo. So that okay. chapter is covering the Abruzzo traditions of a wedding, um, and which are way different than than what we did in Tuscany. So it was really interesting. And then of course we got married in. Minnesota in the middle of winter. Oh, so completely so, different. <laughs> yes, yes. And in, so those traditions. In cool day. Yeah. <laughs> it was 25 below. Oh, yeah, that yeah, will do it. It was <laughs> January. And so really funny stories about our weddings and um, the traditions that go along with them. But, you know, in between is sprinkled in our story and living together for the first time and falling in love. You know, the story of the chocolate cake is in there. And... Um, our decision then to come back to Minnesota. And so when I used to tell people what had hap- what happened to me in my life, you know, that I met this guy who's a chef because I asked him for a recipe, <laughs> and then I moved to Italy, we fell in love, we got married, and I lived there for six years, they kept telling me I had to write a book, especially because of the place where we lived. We lived in the middle of Chianti in a medieval village that was still practicing the traditions that they had for hundreds of years. Mm -hmm. And so for me, that was so important to capture. Um, Like people would tell me stories of being occupied in World War II. They were in their 80s and they remembered that. Mm -hmm. They were children at that time. And so for me, it felt like the time of my life, it was sort of that legacy that I lived and I wanted to leave it for others to read and inspire people as well to listen to their heart, to do what their spirit kind of leads them to do, mm-hmm. even though it's not what other people expect them to do. Yeah. So. No, I think that's a very strong message. And uh, I think you both, you know, followed a path that was unexpected and took risks that probably no one expected yeah. you to take. And I, I think that's a, that's a wonderful thing. Um, and... Well, I'll come back to the book, but I think since we're on this kind of note, Mm -hmm. I wanted to ask you, so it seems like, you know, you have a lot of shared passions between, you know, the food, traveling, Italy, you know, each other. Mm -hmm. So it would seem to me that you found kind of a great union of all those things and then doing these things together, like creating the book and the recipes and having these these cooking classes and these pop-up shows so mm-hmm. or pop-up restaurants and, and cooking classes not shows yeah. That's okay. <laughs> although cooking is an it art is too <laughs> <laughs> but are definitely an art but um you know so well, how does that feel to have all these things kind of Together. you know this huge like risk and then to where you're at now what does that feel like to both of you well for me uh 
It's this unexpected, you know, gift that you get in life. Like, I didn't expect any of this to happen to me. Um, and then, of course, I didn't expect it all to come together like this so nicely to be able to share with other people. Um, the book is a labor of love. It took me four years to actually write after looking at my notes and getting a publisher to help me and an editor to help me. I wanted it to be really professional. And then, of course, deciding which recipes go within each chapter. And so I, I really kind of designed it to be part of the experience. So when, we first, um, when I first met Vincenzo's parents, Hmm. Those that chapter is really, really fun, and it it features all his mom's recipes and his grandmother's gnocchi, hmm. and so you know, kind of which recipes fit in with the story, um, and for me that that's what told the story of us too, hmm. and so when I s- published the book, and then we started talking about the book with people, we had Vincenzo doing cooking classes and me talking about the book, and it, it's just such a cool mm, partnership to be able to do together in life. Um, He has the passion for the food. I appreciate that passion and try to communicate that to other people through the story. And originally, I had to translate everything for him, but now he he speaks English so well. Yeah, very well, yeah. And he's able to explain those traditions when we cook together. So for me, it's like um, a dream come true, that I a dream that I really never... Like, I didn't set out to do this, but it happened and things came together because of listening to what you need in life. And um, that I really appreciate. I'm, I'm grateful for that, for sure. I know Vincenzo yeah. loves sharing his passion and his knowledge for recipes and traditions as well. And for him, this is also a dream. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yes, in my life, um, I, I, I will always work very hard mm-hmm. uh, because this this work is very particular. It's <laughs> mm-hmm. pretty special. Yeah, it's very. Yep. Uh, oh, uh, this work. Oh, you you like it or no, you like it. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Uh, you have passion, okay, because okay. it's very hard. Yeah. Uh, and uh, when I have this opportunity, um, uh, come back in here in uh, USA, mm-hmm. okay. Mm-hmm. It's interesting. <laughs> I try. <laughs> and he's always loved Minnesota. Yes. From the first time I ever introduced him to Minnesota, which was always in January. <laughs> because <liked> that <laughs> is when his restaurant was closed in the in oh. Tuscany because yeah, of the winter why. months were slower. So we would always come back to visit in the middle of January. Mm. And that's why we got married in January yes. here, too, because <laughs> he had that month off. And you can see he's got his Minnesota nice yes. T-shirt on. <laughs> He loves it here. And so for him, I think, too, he recognized the opportunities and, and I things that he could do here. The history of Minnesota. Uh, the history. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. I like it a lot. Yeah. Well, you certainly have a pretty wide open market in the Italian uh, cooking yes. space here. Yeah. There's not, there's there's not, not a lot. lot. There's no, not a lot. No. Uh, this is why I, uh, I like to teach the people for mm-hmm. authentic uh, mm-hmm. recipe. non American Italian style. Right, <laughs> yeah. right, right. Yeah. But Which, I understand because, of course, here you know, we have a big community, Italian community. Mm-hmm. Uh, this why. Uh, mm-hmm. but of course, in New York and Pittsburgh is different because mm-hmm. right. a lot of Italian mm-hmm. is different. Uh, mm-hmm. Here, no. This why yeah. I understand the people know eat the pasta every day. <laughs> right, right. There's yeah. a few of us. <laughs> yes. There's a few of us, but not very many. Um, <laughs> yeah. <clears throat> so <clears throat> I want to ask you a little bit more. So when you're about like the publishing of a book, mm-hmm. and so <sighs> doing that here, I'm assuming you did that in in the U.S. You published I it did. in the U.S. So and yep. probably while you were living in in Rochester. So right. <laughs> what is what was the community like as far as like the writing community mm-hmm. and the publishing community? Like, did you have Support or was it? Yeah. What were the the challenges and kind of opportunities with doing that here? Well, I think that. Um, so first of all, I did pitch it to big publishers, and that was pretty heartbreaking, <laughs> um, because you know they were looking for certain kind of writing, and if it didn't fit that mm-hmm. mold, then you were rejected. And I got lots of rejections, and at many times I thought, well, maybe I shouldn't write the book. I had it about half written and, you know, I was pitching it to big publishers and they were saying, oh, you know, really doesn't fit what we're looking for. It sounds really great, but no thank you. And so um, 
I remember one day I was in the airport in Phoenix, actually. We were back for a visit. Yes. <laughs> and um, because of my connection at Mayo, I had still was working with Mayo, even though I was going back and forth. And so one of the things I did was I would blog write for Mayo Clinic. That, mm-hmm dot com or dot org. And um, I was on the editorial team there. So I got a lot of support from that team. And one of the person, one of the people that really influenced me was Ed Cragen. He is a physician and oncologist, so worked with me in the Cancer Center. And he, of course, had written a few books at that point. And every time we would meet, he would say, you have to write the book. You have to. <laughs> and so he connected me with his editor, in Omaha. Okay. And so she really helped um, Sandy. She's amazing. And she yes. helped me. She would check on me every six months, see how things were going, <clears throat> kept giving me deadlines and, you know, pushing me. And then eventually when I had the chapters really organized well, she <clears throat> did an initial edit and then we even gave it to test readers to get feedback. And that was really helpful. Like what was interesting to them, what wasn't, what could I expand on a little more and what could I take out. Um, And then, of course, um, writing the recipes was a whole nother way of writing. And so um, knowing that not everyone is an established cook, um, all of the little details about how to make something and where to find things, especially the Italian recipes, um, it's not easy to find ingredients. So so here's what you can do to (laughs) substitute. And so it really, it was a, a... a four-year process with an editor and test readers. And then she, my editor, connected me to a publisher in Omaha that she worked with. And so this is a self-published book. Okay. Um, And so, but it's a very, um, I wanted to do it in a way that was really beautiful. And so the layout inside is gorgeous. Um, The recipes look like little recipe cards in handwritten words. The outside cover is actually a watercolor of his restaurant, and then the scenery of, of the village around us and, the, and the, the landscape. So it's just beautiful. I'm happy with. I'm so happy with the way it turned out, and it really, for me, um, looks just like I worked with someone who who maybe was from a big publishing company. But what happens with the book then is you publish it. It goes on Amazon, and so it's available on Amazon as an ebook, as a Kindle book, and as a printed book. Um, but you are the one responsible for for the promotion and marketing of it. There's no big team behind you. Right. <laughs> and so for the last 18 months, I've been doing my best to promote it, and it's been really fun doing that. We've gone to um, Parnassus Book in Nashville. We've gone to San Francisco. We just got back from Las Vegas. So we're getting some really fun invitations, but it's all the two of us doing yeah. it. Um, and, and of course, uh, our publisher has a marketing team that helps us with things like a website and you know mm-hmm. marketing cards and things like that. But I guess what I didn't realize is that that's really a lot of work. It's not just publishing the book. Then what do you do with it? Mm-hmm. You know. Um, and of course, we we have it locally available. You can get signed copies at Dwell Local. You'll be able to get them at Fig, okay. as well. So those are two local places where you can find copies of the book, and they're always autographed by us. Um, and we do events locally as well. So it's a it was a long process um, to to go through that, and we just continue to to work with it. So it's been really fun to see what's happening. Yeah. So it sounds like. The events and kind of the a book tour has been kind of the most successful. Yes. so far. And so. then of course I get lots of rejections though too. So <laughs> I reach out to people who you know I'm hoping would be interested in in hosting an event, and um, I never hear back. So you know, there, it's a lot of work to kind of continue to find those places that have the right connection, or um, can really identify with the story perhaps because it's kind of a interesting combination of a memoir with recipes um and that's not something you see every day no so no I think my husband is in sales and he always tells me you know if you're a baseball player and you're batting 500 that's actually extremely good so you right. know you have to put out all these asks to get maybe yes. you know 30 percent of yeses right. you know and right. <laughs> figuring out how you have to get to that percentage to get where you need so yeah that's always yeah the and no's are always but they're the Maybe. no's are fine. That's yeah. okay, too. Because, you know, the ones that we do get yeses from are the right connections for us, right? And we always meet the most interesting people that 
we never expected to meet. And it leads to another connection or another event. And so that happens with our cooking classes yep. too, where we will have an experience and then someone tells their friend or they'll be talking about it with someone else and then they'll call us and, and we'll get another booking. So we have fun, we have fun with that. And yes. It's definitely um, a passion and um, just, you know, we, we both have full-time jobs besides. Mm-hmm. So we're both working in between and, and um, but really, really love sharing experience through the book readings and the cooking events. So for us, it's, it's a lot of fun. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, and I wanted to ask both, you know, you, like you said, you have full-time jobs and you're doing this, balancing the book, mm-hmm. getting the book out there, promoting the book, doing the cooking classes and um, everything else, and then working together on it as a, as a married couple. So <laughs> what are like, what are some pitfalls, some lessons that you've learned to balance all of those things? Yeah, uh, that's a good question. <laughs> or is it just always a learning in progress? <laughs> well, I think that we do pretty good with balance. Sometimes I overcommit us, and um, I've learned that that's not a good thing because we both get worn out and tired. And, you know, if life is about having that balance, and especially when you're passionate about something, you want to keep that passion and you want to keep that energy, positive energy. Um, so, um, it's, it's been interesting to understand like how many cooking classes we can do in a month, how many book events do I book and how to kind of work that out. We have this giant whiteboard that's a calendar at home. And so we keep it in front of us to remember like, okay, what are we doing this week and who are we cooking with? Um, you know, a lot of times we'll have to send out like a grocery list to someone. So we'll work together on menus and grocery lists. Um, and I think too, the, our foundation, uh, when we first met, we didn't ha- speak the same language very well. So we understand each other's behavior, our um, language without words, mm-hmm. before we even understand what we say yes. to each other. So I can just look at him and say, oh, you know, something, he's stressed out or we need to talk about something. And it's he's, the same with me. he's the same with me. So we have this, uh, this ability to, to do communication without words that... Um, helps us really kind of balance out our relationship. And I always say, you know, when we're cooking together, I'm his sous chef, and so sometimes I get treated like a sous chef and he (laughs) yells at me or something. And I just always think, oh, well, that's normal because he wants everything to be perfect. And um, so we tease each other about it. Part of the <laughs> testing everything. I like I'm his everyone. official taster. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I'm his official taster, and I love learning the techniques that that he's doing. And and for me, as a you know, not a professional cook, but of someone who appreciates food, mm-hmm. I've learned so much from working with him, and um, having fun um, developing some of the desserts that we feature now, and like a focaccia that I love to make. So for me, it's been really fun. <laughs> He's giving me that opportunity, too. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah, so I wanted to... One of my last questions for you guys is, um, you know, what are, your, what are you seeing in the, in the culinary and food scene here, here in Rochester, and, and what, mm-hmm. what are next steps for, um, for what you guys are doing uh, together? Well, I think... What's unique about Rochester is that we have Mayo Clinic. We have a lot of visitors from all over the world who are interested in not only being here for Mayo, they have to eat and enjoy being nourished when they're here for their medical experience. So we have really unique restaurants in Rochester. Um, We have Terza, who, you know, originally was um, focused on being Italian, which is really kind of a unique twist. Um, we had American Italian restaurants, yes. and I would say, mm-hmm. and Vincenzo would say too, it's it's more American Italian than it is mm-hmm. Italian, <laughs> but it's really really good. Um, we also have Blue Duck, we have Pescara. Pescara, we have all kinds of just really unique opportunities, and um, it's a it's, this is a um, community that eats out and celebrates a lot. Yes. And so and we have visitors who who are looking for food experiences. So I think for us that's really unique um, and we love it. We also love the experience that that we've had working with Amy and Linda from Fig and Garden Air. I mean they created a custom herb blend for us called Love in a Tuscan Kitchen. Oh, awesome. And it's one of their yeah. most um, 
sought out herb blends. They people love it, and it's our my favorite things and Vincenzo's favorite things together. Okay, and it's delicious. I'll have to bring you some. I say I'll have to I'll have to find it somewhere. Yes. <laughs> so right now, um, Dwell Local has it. Okay. Along with the book, and then I'm sure, of course, Amy and Linda will have it at Fig, um, and the farmers market. They always had it there as well. Um, but and I think the pop up scene is really fun. So our first pop-up we ever did was at Sopra Soto, that um, Italian store that used to be in uh, University Square. Yes, Do you remember like, that? That sounded familiar, but I couldn't yeah. figure out why. Yeah. <laughs> yes, and so that. that was many years ago <laughs> yeah. when he would come back in January, we would occasionally do a cooking mm-hmm. class. And then of course with Leanne at Zest, um, when she had zest, we did that a couple of times. And then people just sort of had, we had this following. So whenever we would come back, um, we would do Papa, something. In, uh, in Forager. Forager. We, uh, and a couple now, of years ago, we did two or three um, pop-up kit, um, restaurant nights there. And now in Magnolia yes. uh, restaurant in Casson. Okay. So my hometown is Casson, Minnesota. And um, there's a little restaurant there called Mag- uh, Misplaced, Misplaced Magnolia. Yes, mm-hmm. yes. And... Janine is from the South, and so she um, does Southern barbecue and just really Southern cooking, which is really Legal, unique. Yeah. It's delicious. <laughs> and she is closed on Sundays and Mondays. So we were talking with her one day, and she said, why don't you come here and have your pop-up nights here? You can one have my I'm kitchen. <laughs> yeah. yeah, so we've done that quite a bit for the last year. We've had um, every other month or mm-hmm. so we've offered uh, a pop-up night there. It's and been- Really specific fun. region uh, in Italy. Uh, okay. Yeah, we usually feature the foods from like oh Rome region or Abruzzo or Naples or Tuscany, or, uh, Mia Romagna or Sicily. Uh, this yeah. I like to understand the people mm-hmm. uh, traditions tradi- of each region. traditional recipe for every region. Mm-hmm. Uh, and people yeah. like it. <laughs> so you can feel like you're in Sicily for the evening or Tuscany <laughs> in the evening. We want to take you there to that experience. So we do it from the time you walk in the door until the time you leave. And people have just really embraced it. It's been a lot of fun. It's <laughs> amazing. Yeah. Yeah, so I'll just ask to wrap up um, to let everyone know where they can find... Um, you guys online. And mm-hmm. I think we talked a little bit more. You can find the book in the store. And then, yeah, yes. any final thoughts you have? Well, I just really appreciate the, the opportunity to be here with you. Thank yeah, you for thank the you invitation. So this was a lot of fun. Yes. <laughs> and again, you know, if people are looking for the book, Amazon has it available. It'll come to your house within a couple of days. It's beautiful every time. It's amazing how their print-on-demand works. Um, but locally, you can find it at Dwell, Dwell Local on 7th Street, and then at Fig. Um, once they're open, which should be shortly, um, over by um, Trader Joe's in that um, shopping yeah. center. And L- then... Library. Also, four copies in the library, and many of the local libraries have it. Um, so um, just check it out. Um, you can also get them directly from us. We have a Facebook page called Love in a Tuscan Kitchen, and we have Vincenzo's cooking page, which is Vinchef Cooking. So those two are the places for to look for us and follow, and um, that's where we post our events as well. Thank you so much Thank for so having much. us. Yeah, no, thanks so much. I appreciate it. Thanks so much to Cheryl and Vincenzo for joining us on the podcast today. You can find more about them on their website, Love in a Tuscan Kitchen. You can also find them on Facebook at Love in a Tuscan Kitchen and on Facebook with Vin Chef Cooking. So check them out. And these links are also in our show notes. So you can check it out there as well. So if you liked this story, we have many more stories about entrepreneurship and innovation in Rochester on our website at rochesterrising.org. We're also on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and YouTube. And of course, you can find us wherever you listen in to your podcast content. If you know a great entrepreneur in the Rochester area that would be amazing to have on the podcast, let us know. Just send us an email with their name at rochesterrising at gmail.com. Right, that's a wrap for the podcast today. Thanks for listening in to our show. Be sure to subscribe to our podcast wherever you listen in to your podcast content so that you never miss a story of entrepreneurship and innovation coming out of Rochester, Minnesota. We'll be back again next week with a brand new episode. <laughs>